What is a surface? Maybe the first thing you think of is a table or the surface of a road. But more generally, a surface is a shape that is flat, like this piece of paper, but it could be stretched or squished or curved around. It has to have a continuous side. I couldn't intersect this piece of paper with itself, for example, since then you couldn't walk across the whole thing, like walking along a road, without going over an edge. We also want our surface to be smooth, so we can't fold it or add any sharp kinks. The edges of the surface are called boundaries, and if you wanted you could glue them together in various ways to make new surfaces. So for example, I could glue these sides together to make a cylinder. That's a new surface. I could also take the circles formed on each end and glue them together as well. That would give me another surface called a torus, which is shaped like a donut. Or, going back to another piece of paper, I could make a half twist before gluing the sides together. That would make a new surface called a Mobius strip. All of these surfaces have a physical presence. I could make them with a piece of paper and some glue without the paper going through itself. This is called an embedding into 3D space. And if you told me which edges of the paper to glue together, I could always make the new surface by hand without intersections, and it would always physically exist, right? Not always. If you make a cylinder and then identify the remaining edges in the opposite direction, the result is a surface that cannot be embedded into 3D space and does not physically exist. This is the Klein model. The best we can do is this. It's a projection of a Klein bottle in 3D space. Technically, it's called an immersion. Note how this wouldn't actually count as a surface since the sides intersect themselves here. To avoid the intersection, you are forced to introduce a fourth dimension. We can represent this using colour. Imagine if this round bulbous section was coloured red, and as you progressively go around, the colour gradually fades from red, to orange, to yellow, to green, back to yellow, to orange, and then back to red where we started. See how at this point, where the glass goes through itself, the colours are different. By lifting this handle part up into the fourth dimension, using the colour, we've removed the intersection. Then that would be the real Klein bottle. So it really is a surface and doesn't actually intersect itself, you just need four dimensions. Now you might be thinking, okay, but maybe there's a way to twist and stretch and shape the Klein bottle like we did with the paper so that it can be embedded into 3D space. How do you know that the Klein bottle doesn't exist in 3D? To answer that, we need to look at what makes the Klein bottle different. Firstly, notice that it doesn't have any edges or boundaries. A cylinder has two boundaries, one at this end and one at the other end. The Mobius loop we saw earlier only has one boundary, since if you walked along it, you would get back round to the other side because of the half twist. If you went round again, you would get back to where you started, so it's only got one boundary. A sphere is a surface with zero boundaries. There's no way you could fall off the surface if you were walking across it. The Klein bottle is the same. There's no way to walk off the surface. It has zero boundaries. Looking at this plastic box, it's got two sides, an outside and an inside. And I can't pass between the outside and the inside just by moving along the surface. The outside and inside are separated from each other. But notice that the Klein bottle only has one side. If I started on what I thought was the outside and moved through this hole around the inside of the handle, I would end up on what is seemingly the inside of the bottle. 
and in fact I could keep moving along to any other point on the bubble. So there is no inside and outside after all, because there's no way to distinguish one side from another. It's a one-sided surface. However, the most important property of the Klein bubble is that it is non-orientable. Imagine taking a sphere, for instance, and placing a marker on it pointing outwards. Now, however I move the marker across the surface, it will always continue to point outwards. So the marker always has the same orientation, and we say that the sphere is orientable. However, the Mobius loop is different. If you placed a marker pointing outwards and travelled along the surface, you could get back round to the same position, but now the marker is pointing inwards. The orientation of the marker has reversed, so the Mobius loop is non-orientable. But there is no way I could have done that with the sphere. Now, remember that the Mobius loop only has one edge. It turns out that if you take two Mobius strips and glue their edges together, the result is a Klein bottle. Okay, here are two Mobius strips. To make this work, I'll need to do some cutting, but don't worry, we'll mark the cuts so we know where to glue them back together. So first, I'll make a cut along each Mobius strip. This leaves us with two rectangles. I've marked the cuts on the rectangles so we know how to glue them back together to get the Mobius strips. Sides of the same colour are from the same cut, and when gluing together, the arrows will face the same direction. That gives a half twist in the Mobius strip. Okay, nothing's really changed here, I just shifted the shape of the paper a bit. But now I'm going to make another cut along one of the strips like this. I've marked on where the cut was made with the green arrows, so we know where to glue them back together later. But now, if I rearrange a little, we get something that looks very similar to the Klein bottle paper I used earlier. So if I glue these diagonal sides together, which were originally the sides of the Mobius strips, then we get the Klein bottle paper. Notice that I've swapped the side with pink and blue arrows for a single arrow of a new colour, orange. Since the pink and blue sides get glued in the same direction, we may as well mark them together with a new colour. And then you get the paper for the Klein bottle that we originally had. So like before, if we were to glue the green and orange sides together along the arrows, we would get the actual Klein bottle surface. Okay, so we've seen that the Klein bottle is non-orientable and has no boundaries. For the rest of the video, will show that any surface that is non-orientable and has no boundaries cannot exist in 3D space. The problem with the 3D version of the Klein model is that it intersects itself here. So let's look a bit closer at intersections. Take a disc, for example, which will intersect with a flat surface. What are all the possible ways that they can intersect? So, I've got this disc, and I'll use the surface of this water as a model for the flat surface. If I keep the disc flat and pass it through the surface, look at the part of the disc which intersects the surface of the water. If I pull it back out and look at the intersection, we can see it's a line with two distinct endpoints on the edge of the disc. However, if I place the disc so that its edge only just touches the plane, then the intersection is just a single point. At this point, the edge of the disc is tangent to the surface. Notice that it doesn't matter how the disc is angled, since at the point where the edge meets the water, the direction of the edge moves along the water surface. Now, if I curve the disc around like a mountain and push the side through, we'll get the same as before a line with two endpoints on the edge. If we push it through top to bottom instead, the intersection is a closed loop inside the interior of the disc. However, I could also place the top so that it only just touches the plane, and now the surface of the disc is tangent to the water. Again, the intersection is just a single point. Or, 
I could make the whole flat disc tangent to the surface, and then the intersection is the entire disc. We could also distort the disc in different ways to make combinations of what we've seen already. Let's just focus on the intersections where the disc is never tangent to the water. The opposite of tangent is transverse, so we are focusing on transverse intersections. So whenever the disc hits the surface, it comes in at an angle instead of being flat. This also includes the edge of the disc, so if you are walking along the edge, you would never walk along the water's surface, only into or out of the water. Notice that whenever the edge of the disc intersects the surface, the line of intersection must continue until it comes out of another part of the edge of the disc. These two points must be separate. We've seen a few examples of this already, like this one and this one. If the beginning of the line is at an angle to the edge of the disc, then our disc started off at an angle like this, so the line has to come out at a different point. It would be impossible from this position to make the start point and the end point the same unless you made the disc tangent to the water. If instead the line started parallel to the edge and turned away into the disc, the only way it could come back to the same point is if it made a loop like this but then the edge of the disc would be tangent to the water here, so this is not allowed. So, whenever the disc is transverse to the surface, the points of intersection on the edge of the disc always come in pairs, so the number of intersection points on the edge is even. Okay, now take any surface that is non-orientable and has no boundaries. For example, any surface that contains a Mobius strip will work. We know that the Klein model contains a Mobius strip, since you can make it out of two Mobius strips, like we showed earlier. But back to our surface, let's assume that it exists in 3D space. We're going to show that this assumption is false, so that it cannot exist in 3D. Our surface is non-orientable, so there is a path with the same start and end position on the surface that reverses the orientation of the arrows pointing outwards along the path. It's the same as how we reversed the orientation of the marker on the Mobius strip earlier. Now, trace out a path along the top of each arrowhead until we get back over to the starting point with the opposite orientation. Connect the two endpoints of the line together going through the surface to form a closed loop. This new loop intersects the whole surface only once, at this point here, where we chose to go through. At this intersection, the edge of the loop is transverse to the surface, not tangent, because the loop passes through the surface at an angle, rather than just touching the surface and moving away. Now let's use this to make a disc whose edge is the closed loop. This disc might intersect the surface in other places, but adding the disc doesn't change the nature of the intersections at the edge of the disc, which is the original closed loop. So transverse intersections are still transverse. So there is still only one intersection on the edge of the disc. If we distort the interior of the disc while keeping the edge in the same position, we can ensure that all the intersections between the disc and the surface are transverse. If there is a tangent intersection, we can always bend the disc a little bit to remove the intersection, or so that the intersection comes in at an angle, so it's transverse. But if all the intersections are transverse, then we know from before that there must be an even number of intersection points on the edge. But one is not even, so we have a contradiction. We assumed that a non-orientable surface with no boundaries, like the Klein bottle, exists in 3D space, and that assumption is false. So the Klein bottle has no embedding into 3D space, and it can never physically exist in our three-dimensional world. Okay, that might have been a lot. 
but this proves that there is absolutely no way to stretch or shape or squish the Klein bottle so that it does fit in three dimensions without a doubt. And this doesn't just apply to the Klein bottle. If we go back to the sheet of paper and flip the direction of this arrow, then these two sides will be glued in the opposite direction. If we glued the sides together alongside the arrows and did the same for these other two sides, then we would get another surface called the real projective plane. Again, this is a non-orientable surface with no boundaries. So by the same argument, it has no embedding in 3D space. The best we can do is this, Oi's surface. This time there are intersections here and here instead. So this shape is not a real surface. Again, you need to use a fourth dimension to unravel the intersections. It's interesting how just by gluing some edges together, we can easily encounter objects that are just too complicated for our limited three-dimensional world. Complexity can emerge very quickly out of simple phenomena. This happens all the time in mathematics, in number theory, graph theory, chaos theory, the list goes on. Even in the real world, simple systems can give rise to complex behaviour, and it can be really hard to think about or reason with such complicated phenomena. But what I've learned from making this video is to keep asking questions and to keep looking for key properties of your object or some key criteria. Searching for a solution is like hunting for treasure. You have to keep exploring. And who knows, it might just take you into the fourth dimension. But in the meanwhile, thanks for watching.